Good afternoon. This is the House Health Care Committee, and it is Wednesday, February 16th at one in the afternoon. And I want to welcome our witnesses this afternoon um, to help us hear about the important issue of suicide prevention in Vermont. And at the outset, let me thank Representative Black for helping to arrange our witnesses for the day. I appreciate that. Um, so we have between now and just before the three o'clock hour. And let me acknowledge at the outset that I'm certain we could spend a full day or more hearing from our witnesses. Uh, and we will be returning to this subject again at another point in time as well. But this is an opportunity for us to hear from uh, both some folks who are working in this area on behalf of Vermonters at the Department of Mental Health, uh, some folks who are working in our healthcare settings and educational settings, and um, especially today as well, uh, to be able to hear from someone who has the lived experience of dealing with this as a family. And so I want us to be thoughtful as we hear our witnesses. And I'm going to ask our committee members if, as we hear our first two or three witnesses, if we could kind of keep our questions to a minimum so that we're able to get to hearing all of our witnesses. Uh, and then if we have time at the end, uh, we'll have time for to go back and hear from other witnesses with further questions that we may have. Say, understandably, there's a lot, there's a lot to know here. So uh, Deputy Commissioner Kromp, uh, Allison Kromp is our first witness. And uh, I'm going to leave it to you to introduce yourself and your role because you have a history of working in this area of work. And so welcome and uh, Let's hope our video, our, our audio, can you uh, say hello and so we can see if we're hearing you properly? Yes, hello. For the record, <laughs> Allison Kromp, can you hear me? Yeah, we just need to adjust the volume, I think. And uh, does that work? Yeah. Okay, great, yes, I think we can and welcome. And, uh, and I think you have with you uh, for further testimony at some point, also Nick Nichols, is that right? Yes, Nick will be joining um, later on to talk about our partnership on the CDC grant. Okay, terrific. So let's uh, let's begin with you, Allison. And uh, I think in order for us to move through the uh, time we have this afternoon, we'll, as I said, we're not going to be able to hear everything that you could share with us. But if you could give us a sense of where the Department of Mental Health's work is at this point in time and the issue is as you're seeing it from the department. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for having us on this topic today. And I am representing the Department of Mental Health and can talk about what has happened in suicide prevention infrastructure from the state's perspective in the past and what we're proposing as initiatives through the governor's uh, budget request now. Um, and kind of with that package, what, um, what we'll get out of it. And so I did want to highlight that there's been work from the, the state has provided funding to the Center for Health and Learning um, up until this point. That's generally around $178,000 a year, and that's from global commitment. And then we supplement it every year with federal dollars from the mental health block grant. And that supplemental funds generally support things like the suicide prevention um, symposium. That's a big event where we bring experts both nationally and in the state and people learn from, from that. And it's a great place for people to come together. Um, so that's one example of how we supplement um, those efforts. But what we've put forward this year um, and we're encouraged that the governor has supported these initiatives thus far um, around suicide prevention is to expand the package that goes to zero suicide. Um, so that's one of the pieces I wanted to make sure we cover today. The state um, has gotten behind zero suicide as a public health approach. Um, I think you'll hear and probably have heard from Joan Tarallo, who's an expert on that in the Center for Health and Learning folks on what zero suicide is. 
but I just want to highlight that it's it's big, it's expansive, it's not one thing. And so with that funding for zero suicide, we've asked the Center for Health and Learning to support the specifically the designated agencies as a first step. And so things like making sure that their staff um, can be trained in effective suicide safe care. So that those are um, evidence-based practices like CAMS, for example, or COM, which is a, um, a way to talk to individuals about their access to lethal means um, to ensure that if someone's going through mental health crisis, we can make sure that they have ways to have um, safe storage of those items so they um, don't harm themselves. So the Center for Health and Learning has done a great job with that work. We've moved from three designated agencies to seven joining. They're in various stages of implementation. We'd like to get to all 10 and elevate the ones who have already joined in. Um, and some of those elevating activities could be things like follow-up. So that's a big gap in the system. We've identified it every year, mm -hmm. that it's one thing to identify a need. It's another to follow up on it. If you've maybe said, hey, you might need some support, maybe call the warm line or set up an appointment with a therapist. It's that follow up piece and having a way to track it that's really hard to do. And it's imperative. It's where people fall through the cracks. So those are some of the things we want to show up with that additional funding. And you'll see that that's expanded to $260,000 in the budget proposal. That's zero suicide. I'll speak briefly about the two other pieces. One is 988. And so I think I've talked to this committee before, but I'll just remind folks that 988 is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Even though it's a national number, we need to resource it in state. And it is a major part of that resource is to make sure that whoever answers the phone could tell the person about local resources. So that's why it's so important that it is answered by Vermonters. And we have been able to build up capacity using federal grants over the past three years. Those federal grants have ended and we need funding to, con to maintain that service. So the budget that you'll see, the $440,000 for that is to maintain what is existing, which is um, a small crew of folks at Northwestern Counseling um, and another at Northeast Kingdom Human Services. And they're able to cover those phone lines 24 seven at this time. We currently have an average of around 245 Vermonters calling the line every month. It has been creeping up over the past few months. And with a move to 988, we do expect it to increase substantially. The projections are around 500 callers a month. So that is that line item. And then the last piece to um, the Department of Mental Health's Suicide Prevention Initiative is elder care outreach. We believe that we need to do a lot more around targeting specific at-risk groups. There are more than just older Vermonters that we need to reach, but as a first step, um, this was identified as a program that's very helpful and supportive to older Vermonters because it goes to their homes and it, the folks who do that are trained in suicide safe care and assessing for suicidality. So that would be to expand a program that um, works well. So that is the package out there right now in terms of the budget proposal um, for suicide prevention. And I would just state, um, we've seen the numbers of suicide deaths go up tragically year over year for the past decade. 2021 is going to be the worst we've seen in a very long time. And we really wanna make sure that there's extreme attention paid to this issue and that we really build the infrastructure to do this work well. And I think when you hear from Nick Nichols, you'll hear that a major thing that's happened at the state that hasn't happened in, you know, I don't wanna say it's never happened, I'm new to the state, but more so than what I've seen in the past is a real partnership with the Department of Health to start treating suicidality as a public health issue. And so we are co-partners on a grant that is geared towards building infrastructure over the next five years. None of those pieces, and Nick will talk about this, um, include paying for services. And so that's the funding that the Department of Mental Health has been putting forward and wants to expand, is the actual ongoing costs of providing those services. I'm happy to answer any questions. Alyssa? Just really, just really quickly, do you have updated numbers for 2021 since, since you last presented to this committee? We do. So the last updated number is 141 Vermonters lost to suicide. 
as of the last weekly report. Okay, and how many death certificates still undetermined yet? I believe there were nine. I will double check that for you. It is down substantially from the 50 that when we last spoke. Okay, thank you. And can we just, I just wanna make sure we understand the data point that you just uh, gave us, which is 141 individual Vermonters who died by suicide in the calendar year 2021. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, perhaps Nick has other data that uh, can be shared or perhaps you could forward to us. Maybe we'll just use it, do it that way. Perhaps you could forward to the committee the data across the last decade or whatever numbers you have available so that we can see the unfortunate uh, trajectory of these uh, numbers. Is that something you could provide to the committee? The Department of Mental Health has the numbers through 2020 because um, the Department of Health um, does not publish them until they are official. And the, so 2021 is not yet official. So we can give you the chart um, that you're speaking of where it really gives you the dismal trajectory of increases over time. And then you can know that it will look to be at least 141 in 2021 yeah. and that number may increase. Yes, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll understand that to be the case. I'm gonna suggest we hear next from Nick Nichols and then uh, we'll continue to hear from other witnesses and hold most of our questions. Uh, Nick Nichols, I uh, welcome you to introduce yourself and you are with the Department of Health at this point, am I correct? That is correct for the record. Uh, my name is Nick Nichols. I am uh, currently serving as a suicide prevention grant uh, coordinator at the Department of Health. And as Deputy Commissioner Crump mentioned, um, also working closely with the Department of Mental Health um, to coordinate a lot of suicide prevention work that is supported under my grant with other activities. And I believe I'm here today to take about 10 minutes just to provide an overview of a relatively new uh, CDC uh, grant that Vermont has received and talk about how it um, supplements and complements some of the work that has already been occurring and is being planned. And, if it's okay, I was gonna share my screen and um, I have a short presentation uh, to share with you. That's fine with us. Okay. Okay, can folks see that okay? Not yet, Not no, we don't see anything yet. We see you and other witnesses, but not your sh screen share. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's, here it's coming. I think it's coming. Yes, there you go. Okay, good. Good job. All right. So, <clears throat> so, um, so this is, as I mentioned before, we have a, a federal grant from the um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's a, a five-year grant. Um, that runs from September 2020 to August of 2025. Um, and so we're actually already into year two of the grant. Uh, there were some delays in the grant getting started um, just because of COVID and um, waiting for joint fiscal approval. And then there was also a hiring freeze that occurred um, last year. And so the grant actually um, wasn't fully staffed until August um, of last year. And um, it's a grant award that goes to the Department of Health but it has two principal investigators, and so it's co-managed um, by both the Department of Health and the Department of Mental Health. In terms of funding, as Allison mentioned, um, yeah, we're not allowed to pay for services using this funding, but there are um, some different elements of, um, of capacity that we can pay for to improve services. And so it funds uh, grant staffing, and so it funds my position, as well as a full-time data analyst and a communications coordinator. Um, and um, all these positions are temporary. Uh, and so once the grant ends in August, 2025, um, our positions go away. Uh, it also pays for things like training, consultation, um, incentives and staff support uh, to develop and improve suicide prevention services and resources. Um, and it also pays for um, things like public facing messaging, communication strategies, 
um, and just a general approach is to engage directly with the public to help them find support. And then lastly, uh, it pays for uh, comprehensive evaluation of all of our grant activities. Um, as Allison had talked about before, uh, you know, the CDC grant, and in general, I think Vermont is moving towards taking more of a public health approach to suicide prevention. And through this grant, um, it really enhances and further takes Vermont in a better direction um, to add on different elements of using a public health approach. And so uh, essentially that means that through this grant, we're focusing on protecting the health of communities and supporting prevention among the large groups of people. Um, and as we know, um, you know, with a number of people who die by suicide, um, they're in some cases not engaged with the treatment system. Um, or they're not showing up in emergency departments asking for help. And so because of that, um, using a population approach and including elements of primary prevention are, are critical to what we do. Um, it's also true, unfortunately, you know, that um, often first attempts um, are fatal or sometimes they're fatal. And so we don't always get a second chance um, with some of these folks who are struggling with suicidality. And so because of that, um, Vermont needs to continue to um, not only enhance and strengthen its treatment system, um, but also expand the strategies um, outside of our treatment system into communities and other programs. And I would say, you know, a general theme of this grant really is that all Vermonters have a role in facing suicide. And so whether you're someone um, who's struggling with suicide or your, um, suicidality yourself, um, or just a community member who may notice that someone is struggling, um, or if you work in a program that, that, that may interact with people who are at risk, um, we all have some role that we can play in helping to reduce suicides and supporting each other. And this image here is just an example of a public campaign that we are gonna be rolling out um, to really connect with the public directly and um, encourage them um, and all of us to be talking about suicide and thinking about ways that we can play a role. Um, because as I said before, it, you know, it's absolutely important that we improve our treatment system, but we all need to get involved as Vermonters um, to address this issue. Um, the CDC does also ask us to use our data to focus our strategies on particular populations that are experiencing a higher burden of suicidality. suicidality. And so um, while a lot of the grant activities will benefit all Vermonters, we also will be tailoring um, some of our strategies um, to focus on particular populations that are experiencing either higher rates of suicide death or higher rates of um, uh, morbidity, like um, visits to the emergency department for suicidal ideation or self-harm. And so that includes uh, Vermont residents, um, basically um, re Vermont residents who are working age 15 to 64, as well as um, working age males, um, rural Vermonters, um, people who are living with disabilities, and people who identify um, as LGBT or Q. So I'm gonna just quickly summarize uh, some of the strategies that we'll be um, using with this grant. Uh, and um, you know, if, if you have any questions about the specifics of, of these, please let me know. Um, we're gonna be expanding gatekeeper training, um, which focuses on um, working with people who are not clinicians, but who may be in a position where they interact with a lot of people who may be at risk and teaching them how to be more comfortable to notice when someone may be struggling, um, intervene, support them, and hopefully connect them with other services. There's gonna be a strong focus on reducing access to lethal means um, consistently when you look at the research. Um, there's been a number of different initiatives that focus specifically on reducing access um, to things like firearms, medication, um, when people are struggling with suicidality. And when you do that, um, you see lower rates of death in the attempts. Uh, we'll also be you know, having a strong focus on improving connectedness among um, focused populations that are at higher risk. Um, and so that includes developing peer support and peer networks among different communities, which will include first responders, uh, farmers, as well as suicide loss survivors. Uh, we'll be also looking to uh, improve how Vermont as a state um, responds when there is a suicide death um, and how we support both individuals and families who have experienced a suicide death, as well as community and organizations and helping all of them um, get the best support um, for that very difficult time. 
Uh, Allison mentioned zero suicide, you know, and that's a big component of what the Department of Mental Health has been doing. Uh, primarily, their work has been focused on expanding zero suicide within our designated mental health um, agencies. And so this grant is going to supplement that work by bringing um, elements of zero suicide into other healthcare settings, because we know um, not all people who are struggling with suicidality end up at a designated agency, and they may be seen by their primary care physician, they may be seen at an emergency department um, or, or another healthcare provider, or even a non-designated agency mental health provider. And so this grant will be adding in elements of zero suicide um, into other parts of our healthcare system, um, including emergency departments. And then we'll also, you know, given that we are focusing on prioritizing supports for rural Vermonters, we are also going to be working to um, expand access to suicide safe mental health care using telehealth. Uh, as I mentioned before, this grant also has a very strong focus on communications and public messaging. And so um, as an additional strategy, we are going to be having a lot of um, uh, campaigns and branding, social media, um, web-based supports, um, hoping to reach people both who are struggling with suicidality to help them become more aware of resources, um, become more comfortable talking about um, something and asking for help um, if they're struggling, and then also or encouraging the rest of us um, to do something if we see someone who is struggling. So technically we're already into year two of this grant. And so I did want to just highlight a couple of things that have been that have happened over this first year. Um, as <clears throat> Deputy Commissioner Kronk mentioned, um, there's been a, a really uh, incredible level of coordination between the Department of Health and the Department of Mental Health um, to coordinate this, coordinate this grant. We actually have weekly meetings um, where we get together both to coordinate activities of this grant as well as discuss how this grant best um, enhances and supports other activities within the state. Um, <clears throat> we've already been able to uh, uh, enhance our data analysis um, to improve our program planning, both at the state level um, and in regional levels. Um, we're also gonna be using this capacity um, to do what's referred to as a social, social autopsy, um, looking at um, for people who die by suicide, what are the different services and supports that they have received or didn't receive um, uh, during the years prior to their death to see if that can help improve um, where we intervene and how we intervene. Um, we have to. Um, we have also been able to um, complete what I what I think is the first statewide suicide prevention communications and marketing plan, um, which I think is really going to be an important um, component of how we address this issue um, as a public health issue. Uh, then also through this grant, we've been able to engage with and start working with additional programs and also pull in additional funding um, to support suicide prevention. And so two examples of that is um, we're now working with Invest DAP, which is the largest DAP provider in the state, um, to collaborate with them to both develop peer support networks for groups like first responders and farmers, um, as well as engage with employers as a place where we can um, help uh, support and improve the mental health um, of people who are working in those organizations and potentially use that as a place where we can identify people who may be struggling and use things like EAP counseling um, to support people. And we also are very excited to be working with the Vermont Program for Quality and Healthcare. Um, they've been able to coordinate um, three different funding sources, our grant, as well as this, another federal grant and a private foundation um, to pull together um, a, a very um, comprehensive quality improvement project that's going to be offered to all of emergency departments um, to, to implement elements of zero suicide. And we actually just had our kickoff steering committee um, uh, today, and uh, we're very excited about the possibilities of how that can both improve long-term care, but also reduce some of the pressures that emergency departments are experiencing. Uh, I also just want to, you know, emphasize, um, you know, in addition to coordination with the Department of Mental Health, um, we are, you know, there's a strong emphasis on coordinating with all of the different partners in the state who have already been doing suicide prevention work in the state. And so this is just a list of all the partners that we've already engaged with and are working with. You know, the Center for Health and Learning has been a longtime partner um, and champion for um, suicide prevention. I know they were very helpful in helping write this grant. And so they're a key partner, um, as well as a lot of these other organizations that are working very closely with. And then I do just want to, you know, sort of emphasize as before, 
that, um, you know, I think when you look at all the needs in Vermont and the strategies for addressing suicide prevention from a pu public health approach, um, we feel that the strategies of this grant really complement and enhance the work is that, already that has already happened within the, um, within the state, um, as well as the expansions that are being proposed by the Department of Mental Health. And so when you, I think you combine the work of what's being proposed by the Department of Mental Health and what's being added on um, through this grant, we're very hopeful that that will take Vermont in a really positive direction um, to address suicide prevention as a very complex public health issue. So I will stop there and um, ask if anyone has any questions. Well, I, I'm sure there are questions and I certainly have some, uh, but let's, I think, let's hold our questions and uh, we'll, are you going to be able to stay with us during the next period or the next hour and a half, Nick? Yeah, I'm gonna be here for the, uh, for the, the whole two hours. Okay, terrific. I just wanted to check because I, I think there are, probably our questions to uh, give you an opportunity to say more about. But uh, again, I think we're gonna hold our questions for now. And uh, we'll, so jot them down and I will do my best to hold my questions as well. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to working with you in this role uh, over a period of time. It's very important work. Great, thank you. So with that, I think we're going to turn next to hear from uh, Terry is lovely. Uh, and Terry, you, there you are. You're good. Uh, welcome. Uh, and I think we've actually crossed paths along the way, somewhere along the way, but uh, nice to have you join us today. And um, I'm going to have you introduce yourself because I think you, you wear multiple hats uh, in terms of uh, what you share with us. Uh, what your roles are and share with us some of what would be helpful for us to hear about from you today around suicide prevention in Vermont. Thank you. And um, thank you to Representative Black for inviting me to speak today and for the House Committee for hearing me. Um, so in the spirit of transparency, I do wear multiple hats um, in, in Vermont around suicide awareness and prevention. I have worked for a designated agency for 17 and a half years. Um, although I'm in more of an administrative role of um, training, advancement, and development, I have always considered myself a boots on the ground kind of gal and understanding how systems work together. Um, I have carried the after hours on call pager for years. I've answered um, those lifeline calls, those crisis calls. Um, but today um, I'm coming to you as a field advocate representing the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. More importantly, so I can represent the broad scope of my lived experience of what's really going on in Vermont and all of these systems and all of the asks that we have in our budget today. So um, we have put together a plan and thinking about what's going to work for Vermont of sustainability of funding for systems in place. Suicide is a public health care crisis. And nobody comes to this work of um, suicide awareness and prevention without some level of lived experience. So in transparency also, um, 29 years ago, I attempted to take my own life. So I'm an attempt survivor. And I've only been able to recently talk about that in the last year and a half because of the stigma. Because I didn't want people to look at me like I was incompetent or less of a person. I'm a mental health professional and I've worked in this field for a very long time, but I felt like if I told people that I attempted to take my life, they were going to look at me differently and not respect my values, my views, my knowledge, my education around this. But that's not really what propelled me into this field. Um, six years ago, my nephew lost his life to suicide. And that's really what pushed me into saying we need to do better. We need to do better as um, a mental health agency, as a very rural community, as a rural state, as a nation around the work in suicide prevention and awareness. So I found my family with the American Foundation Suicide Prevention Vermont chapter. I'm a um, board member of um, 
walk chair, I trainer, I wear so many hats in AFSP world, but field advocacy. And I want to just be honest, um, this is out of my wheelhouse of comfort of like, I'm not political at all, but I have boots on the ground lived experience. And I understand how all of these asks work together and are going to support Vermont in the public healthcare crisis of suicidality. So that's what I want to share with you today is my lived experience and working in it, volunteering, being an attempt and a loss survivor of how I see these systems fitting together and why we need to fund them. Because any area of our requests that are underfunded does a disservice to the other areas that we're requesting. We're only as strong as our weakest links in the world of suicidality mental health, physical health, everything we do, we're only as strong as our weakest link. So we really need to consider funding all of these areas as asked or proposed to make sure that we're providing a strong sustainability of systems in Vermont. So I'm not sure um, if I can share screen for a minute, if I can request share screen. So I put, I put together this graphic because in my mind, when we think about all of the areas of um, suicide prevention and awareness, it's hard to wrap your mind around the impact of how one area affects the other. And I wanna make sure that we're getting a clear picture of we're not just throwing out funding ideas and requests without understanding this, how the systems all work together. So I want to just start um, on the prevention funding, and I do also want to be transparent. Um, the National Association of State Mental Health Programming um, put this model in one of their proposals, and I really loved it, and it resonated with me because it's easy to understand. So I borrowed their model and recreated it for what's really going on here in Vermont. So in prevention, 988 funding. We're asking for a budget adjustment of $910,000 in addition to the $440,000 proposed for a total of $1.35 million to create a designated 988 crisis trust fund for sustainability. 988 is happening. We are not going to change that. As of July 15th, 1-800-273-TALK is going to become 988. We're going, we have a projected um, call increase from Vibrant, which is our national provider of 30%. So Allison mentioned those averages of 245 calls that are coming into Vermont every month is going to increase by 30%. There's already been a significant increase um, from October to January of this year in one Lifeline Center, there was a 51% increase in call volume. So 988 is happening, whether we choose to fund it or not. We need to look at sustainability of funding. 988 is a lifeline. It is a service where you can get a live person on the phone within 30 seconds when you are struggling in a mental health crisis, when you're feeling suicidal, when you're feeling lost, when you are feeling nobody else understands. There's trained professionals on the other end of that call that will support you through your crisis. 90%, 97% of the calls that we receive are, um, are handled over the phone and don't require further intervention other than maybe some follow-up calls, some resource coordinations. That is reducing the burden on our physical health providers. We're not sending people to the emergency room every time they feel hopeless and helpless or are having suicidal thoughts. There's a lot that goes into a lifeline call. Um, there's assessments, there's imminent risk. Um, there's a lot of things that determine how we can safety plan with somebody to keep them in least restrictive situations in our state. So the funding, the sustainability of funding for 988 needs to be a line item in the budget as a trust for ongoing funding within the state and not just temporary increases here. It needs to be sustainable funding for the service that we are providing for Vermonters. And the best part about our 988 and our lifeline in Vermont is the call responders get Vermont. We are not the same as California, Massachusetts, other large states. We're a very rural state. So we understand the grassroots um, services, the barriers, the transportation, the lack of broadband, all of those issues are taking into consideration 
by our lifeline call responders because we live and work in Vermont. So who better to help you through your struggles of hopelessness and helplessness than other Vermonters? Our zero suicide funding, I cannot speak enough about how this has impacted our state on such a significant level. The Vermont Suicide Prevention Center is a private public sector. So there are so many voices at the table of looking at different angles of how this funding, how supports, how everything we do affects what the outcomes are, how we change systems. The greatest part of zero suicide is it really lets each agency look at what's happening in their community. What's happening in the Northeast Kingdom is not happening in Burlington. It's not happening in Rutland. It's not happening, um, it looks different in Brattleboro than it looks in Newport. So zero suicide allows designated agencies and also we're hoping to extend this project to our physical health providers, hospitals, primary care physicians. We've already started doing some of this work through mini grants. Um, through the Center for Health and Learning, where we've invited our physical health partners into the conversation of mental health, how to implement program policies and procedures. Zero suicide is a way to spread evidence-based practices through different mental and physical health organizations. You cannot just say, here, here's a pot of money and go do it. How are we doing it as a state? What systems make sense? What are the evidence-based practices? CAMS Care, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality is an evidence-based practice proven to reduce the drivers for suicidality in eight to 10 sessions. Quick, easy, done. We need to get more people CAMS Care trained. We need to write policies and procedures on safe suicide pathways, both in mental and physical health. It has been an absolute honor to be part of this Zero Suicide Project as one of many that have already joined, but we need to get all designated agencies, primary care physicians and physical health um, providers on board with creating the safe pathways so we know what to do when somebody screens positive. There's policies, there's procedures, there's evidence-based practices. And in my heart of heart, I'm a trainer. We need to have a well-trained workforce, which is what suicide funding does for the state of Vermont. So other areas in the preventative funding arena that are not in our ask today, but I felt like they're notable. 10% increase to designated agencies and SSAs. We are the ones doing the hard work. We're the boots on the ground. We are severely underpaid. We are overworked. We are oftentimes putting our own mental health aside to serve the needs of our clients and our community. We need a 10% increase for DAs and SSAs for sustainability of our mental health systems. Mobile crisis units. I love the analogy of why would I go to the podiatrist for a cardiovascular issue? Why would I send police or an ambulance out when it is not a law enforcement issue or a physical health issue? The expansion of mobile crisis units are going to be able to bring the circle of support for mental health crisis all the way around. It is also going to decrease the use of emergency rooms, which will take the burden off from our physical health providers. The pilot program in Rutland has already shown that this is an, a proven way of decreasing emergency use, room use and providing that in the field, real-time tangible supports. <clears throat> Additional hospital supports, more psychiatric beds in Vermont. We need more places where we can send people that need help, either voluntarily or involuntary. So we at um, the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center and AFSB support the additional um, funding for any hospitalization or any hospitals that will provide that psychiatric support. So thinking postvention, um, the 988 funding also allows for follow-up calls. One of the big things is when you're in the immediate crisis and you're able to get through it, that warm handoff, that follow-up call, did you get what you need? Did the resources I give you work for you? Can I help you with anything else? Circling back around to the person that was in crisis prevents future crisis. 
that's a cost savings on our system. And we have already implemented um, systems for those follow-up calls from the National Lifeline to happen. And we're continuing to grow that part of the program while also implementing other um, other initiatives through the um, 988 funding, such as chat and text, which Vermont is about to take on and things of that nature. Zero suicide, again, with both prevention and postvention, I can't drive home enough how having a well-trained workforce, clear policies and procedures, results-based accountability to everything we do, having all seats, all sectors represented at the table of what is going on in Vermont, that is vital to a healthy, strong system for mental health crisis in Vermont. And again, the increase to designated agencies and um, SSAs is also um, a vital part of pre and post pension. So this is the, the graph that I borrowed, stole. I made it up myself, but I borrowed the model from um, the National Association from State and Mental Health. So this is currently what's going on. We have a person in crisis. They call a crisis line or they end up in the emergency room. But this, our hope is, is they're gonna use 988 or they're gonna call their local DA or SSA crisis number. Most of those calls are going to be able to be handled over the phone. So we're gonna jump right to the wrap services and supports. So again, 97% of Lifeline calls answered in Vermont right now are currently handled over the phone without any emergency room intervention. Somebody is feeling hopeless, helpless, suicidal. We're talking them through it. We know suicide is a long-term answer to short-term problems. And if we can help people identify their drivers, those short-term problems, and put safety planning around those drivers, they're not going to get to the place of full-blown crisis. But in the event that they are, those 3% of calls that do need that immediate rescue, currently we rely on 911, we re rely on Vermont State Police, our local police departments, our ambulance. So when we're on that crisis call, both as designated agencies, SSAs, and lifeline providers, we're calling 911 and we're sending our physical health providers and our law enforcement out to intervene in the situation. They're not mental health professionals. They don't know how to sit comfortably in someone's uncomfortable mental health struggles. So by creating mobile crisis units through every sector in Vermont, we are providing an enhanced service that's going to actually reduce um, stress on our physical health providers and emergency room care. We're going to get to the root of the problem quicker and we're going to be able to respond to the drivers for the suicidal thoughts. Mental health treatment facilities. Again, as we go up this model, we're getting into more restrictive, more cost, costly um, supports for individuals. So where we wanna go is down the model to the least restrictive. So if we can get to people using the lifeline or their local crisis numbers and then wrap supports around them, we're gonna save Vermont money. And not only that, we're gonna save our emergency room, stress of having their beds taken up for people with physical health systems. We're gonna save our police, Vermont State Police and local police, the burden of having to deal with mental health crisis that they're not trained to do. And they're just gonna call us anyway. So now you have multiple first responders dealing with the mental health crisis. So mental health treatment facilities, extremely short in Vermont right now through the pandemic and even before the pandemic. People are waiting up to 14 days in our emergency rooms, in our swing beds, waiting for a mental health crisis facility to be available to treat their suicidality. We can't have that. That puts too much of a burden on our emergency room departments, too much of a burden on our healthcare system. We need to have more readily available psychiatric units to treat suicidality so we can go to least restrictive, most cost-effective measures. And honestly, people that are struggling with mental health issues and the thought of suicidality, hospital is the worst place for them. If we can, can figure I, out- how to Can I just interrupt and just say that you do not need to persuade this committee to that, to that challenge. I mean, I'm not right. wanting to visit at all, but we've taken lots of testimony and understand the tremendous 
pain that's caused by having to wait in hospital emergency rooms for uh, mental health services. So there's we have deep appreciation of that issue. Yeah, and I'm just going to put a plug in for our youth because I'm very active in that community on a volunteer and professional level. It's even more sad for our youth. There's less services available in Vermont to treat youth mental health struggles. So please, I, I won't I won't get stuck on that. Um, so wrap services and supports. This is the ultimate outcome. If we can avoid these steps in the middle of the mobile um, response and the mental health treatment facilities, and we can wrap people in a warm mental health treatment hug, for lack of better words, mental health services, case management, warm handoffs for people that were struggling to make sure that they're connected to the resources that they need, follow-up calls and care coordination. Ultimately, we're gonna get over here where we're decreasing emergency service use, emergency department use, police and first responder intervention, jails. This is going to save Vermont millions of dollars. We have to invest in the system as a whole. So I just also wanna go back to um, the Vermont suicide prevention, the Vermont zero suicide prevention. Um, we are asking for an adjustment of that budget for an additional $825,000 up from the 260,000 for a total of one, um, $1, 000, $1 000, $85,000 to expand that through the rest of the DAs that aren't on board to continue the supports of the DAs that are already on board, SSAs that are already on board, and also bring it out to our physical health providers, our hospitals, our primary care physicians. So this, this is our way of showing um, how all this funding is put together because I think sometimes it's hard to think about in Vermont of there's all these grassroots initiatives going on, but nobody really knows who's doing what and what sector with what hat. And again, I came here today wearing multiple hats, but my field advocate hat is on. How are we gonna pull this all together? How are we gonna pull this all together as a state? The proposed statewide director's position. Somebody that has their thumb on every sector of what's going on in Vermont. The training, the evidence-based practices, our first responders, our physical health providers, our mental health providers. How are we all working together as a state? That's what's going to pull all of these services and supports together to make sure that there is a continuing of care throughout the systems. And also, I just want to put a, um, a plug in for the expansion of elder care and um, the vet to vet visitors program, two of our highly uh, most vulnerable population in, in Vermont. We have a large um, vet population and an even larger aging population in Vermont. So I would support those as very much preventative and postvention um, post funding areas um, to suicide prevention within Vermont. So I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. I honestly could talk all day about suicide awareness and prevention, how our systems work together. My lived experience, the work that we're doing um, locally and as a state and I just mostly want to thank you um, for taking the time to listen to me today and try to help put the bigger picture together of, of what's really going on in our city as far as our funding asks. One area that's not funded will directly affect the other. Thank you. Thank you for outlining how things fit together. And also thank you for your own uh, frankly, frankly, your sharing of your own personal lived experience as a part of your testimony here today. Uh, I think uh, we appreciate what it means, as you said, uh, sometimes it's years before someone feels able to share, much less share publicly in our kind of setting, uh, something as uh, personal and uh, important as that. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And so with that, uh, we are going to turn to hear from uh, Emily Hackett Fisk, uh, Emily is, there you are. Hi, Emily. <laughs> it's, it's Sorry, I'm having computer issues today. So I'm on my phone. I apologize. I tried to get on with my computer, but my screen died. So I apologize. 
completely understand. I was in exactly that position last night as I was trying to hold my phone and not shake, but have the phone shake in my hands as I was dealing with something else. Uh, but uh, we're uh, happy to have you join us today. And uh, as I understand, you are with us and are willing to share with us some of your own personal uh, experience with the issue of suicide. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you, Emily, to introduce yourself, to share your story, and to uh, have us listen and uh, listen attentively. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I apologize ahead of time if I if my voice shakes. Um, so um, one of the greatest, I'm a resident of Williston. Um, one of the greatest things in my life is being a mom to my six children. Um, on September 24th, 2020, um, I received a call um, that changed our lives forever. And um, my 12 and a half year old son, Ryan, died by suicide um, using a firearm that was unsecured in another home. Um, it was very unexpected. Um, and so um, thank you for letting me um, come and speak about him today to put a face and give him back his voice. Um, so I, I know that many of you have read his obituary. Ryan was an old soul from the day he came home, extremely empathetic and compassionate, super friendly, a little shy at first at times, but once you got to know him, he was very friendly. He was uh, had a great sense of humor, as a lot of kids do. Um, he he was his younger siblings' world. He was always meant to be the oldest child and the biggest brother. Um, and so, you know, I feel very blessed that I was able to have the time with Ryan, um, but. This has extremely impacted our lives. Um, the day that I received the call, um, I had been working and I received a call from a neighbor and that had told me Ryan had been in an accident um, and that I was, you know, I needed to come. And at the time I was in um, actually in New Hampshire and I, you know, I was thinking he broke his leg or, you know, got hit by a car on a bike or um, things like that. It wasn't until later I, I started to ask the neighbor, I called him back to tell them, let them know I was coming because the, um, his, his father was unable to speak with me at the moment. And um, that's when he had told me, um, Ryan tried to hurt himself is what he said. And of course, with I think any mom's reaction was what? It, it didn't make sense. None of it made sense. It was, it, it just didn't make sense. And I'm thinking, okay, we're going to be at the hospital. We're going to see them at the hospital when we get there. I was two and a half hours away. And I figured Ryan had a severe peanut allergy. Maybe he tried to eat a peanut or, you know, you, you think, did he get some pills or, you know, did he try to hurt himself, you know, by asphyxiation or, and that I was going to see him in the hospital, but I was preparing myself that he was going to be in the hospital, you know, maybe on life support or something. So it was a long two and a half hour drive up partway through the drive. Um, my husband's a police officer, so we, we under, I understand when an officer is telling you, when will you be arriving over and over every time you speak to them? And I kept asking, well, am I meeting at the hospital? And they wouldn't answer. I knew what that meant. Um, and while I was driving up with my husband, um, we found out that he had passed. Um, I can't even explain that moment. 
Um, and my, my older daughter um, happened to be home with her brother, their fathers, and she came home here and a family friend came over and stayed with my parents and my daughter. And I had to come home and tell her. And that's a scream you'll never forget. But it wasn't until that moment afterwards. I never even considered an unsecured firearm. And it wasn't until that moment that she mentioned a gun. And I didn't, I was, I didn't understand. Um, I had asked some people to kind of describe Brian. And one of the women that has taught him swimming over a long period of time said he was very determined and he liked to challenge himself and he was compassionate towards others. His school teachers always said he was kind and caring to everyone. Parents of girls in his class and even one of his female classmates wrote how wonderful he was. That he loved a kid, but he was never mean to anybody. People always want a reason why things happen. And there really is no reason, right? There, there, there were no signs. You know, we all talk about suicide prevention and look for the signs. Well, the signs are not always there. And speaking to one of his teachers, he said he was the last kid they would have ever thought would have done this. The impact of that death has rippled through as far as, you know, other states. Not just here, not just our home, not just his school. He has many friends that attend other schools. Um, the means really matter. If he had not had access to an unsecured firearm, he most likely would be here. He would have been in the hospital. A gun is the most lethal way that someone can take their life. I'm sorry. Can I just say, can I just say, Emily, that you do not need to apologize to us at all for your emotion, your your voice. We appreciate you just taking the time to share with us. Right needs his voice back and that's what I need to do for him and for others so this does not happen again. If we can interrupt the moment by keeping our children from having a access to a gun, it could save another child's life. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you for your courage and your willingness to be with us today about what has to be one of the most difficult experiences any mother or parent, a family member can experience. And I hope as we listen to others talk about prevention, that you'll know that while we may, ne we may never be able to prevent every tragedy, we, I think I dare say, are committed to preventing every tragedy that we can. And we will continue to take further. We'll listen to other proposals, take other steps. Today is only one part of what we're, what we will undertake over the next period of time. So your, your sharing with us today is uh, 
very powerful and touches touches me deeply and I'm sure it touches others as well. Thank you. So Emily, as with the other witnesses, I'm I'm going to encourage our members not to pose questions at this point in time, but to just sit with your testimony, your story. Uh, and uh, so know that we're thinking about you and what you shared with us as we listen to other witnesses as well. So thank you. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Rebecca Bell. I see on your screen it says Becca, so I'm in, and actually it's Dr. Bell, I believe, but uh, we're never quite sure how to handle titles. Um, but uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, you've been here to hear some of the other witnesses, perhaps all of them, and to hear the story that we just heard as well. Um, I welcome you to introduce yourself to us and uh, know that you have a play a part in this important issue and uh, welcome to hear, look forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to introduce myself and then I'm going to give um, Dr. Tom Delaney a chance to introduce himself. And then we actually have a few slides that we're going to share together. Um, so if I could also get um, screen share available, that would be great too. Um, so I'm back in I'm Becca Bell. I, um, I'm a pediatric intensivist, so I work in the pediatric intensive care unit at the University of Vermont Children's Hospital. So I care for um, infants, children, and adolescents who are critically ill or critically injured. Um, I'm also, um, this is the third year I've been the president of the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I do injury prevention work with the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program through the um, Modern College of Medicine at UVM and the Department of Pediatrics at UVM. And I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at the, at the College of Medicine. Uh, I also, um, relevant to this discussion, um, part of the um, statewide suicide data, suicide prevention data work group and I sit on the child fatality review team for the state of Vermont. So we review um, child deaths, unexpected child deaths, including suicide. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Delaney to introduce himself. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, if you could speak up maybe just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, my name is Tom Delaney. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the UVM Lawyer College of Medicine, and I also work in the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program. Um, I don't do any clinical work. Um, I'm very involved with uh, uh, program evaluation and applied research as it relates to different mental health topics, though, and I, I teach in the medical school and in the master's in public health program. Um, Becca, if you want to start sharing the slides, I can do an orientation. So Becca and I um, have collaborated for about three years now on, a, on one public health prevention strategy uh, aimed at preventing or reducing the burden of firearm deaths, and specifically firearm suicide deaths. And we're going to, um, Becca will actually talk about that. I'm going to tee us up by just talking about some background about um, patterns and epidemiology of suicide deaths in Vermont and drilling down a little bit on the firearm deaths. Um, it's important for us to acknowledge that the opinions we're expressing are our own opinions, and they don't reflect any, any of our employers, uh, which is the University of Vermont Medical Center for Becca and uh, University of Vermont for me. Um, it's also important for us to acknowledge uh, some really key partners in this work. So a lot of the data I'll be showing you was actually um, compiled by the Vermont Department of Health or the Vermont Department of Mental Health. Um, VDH is an amazing resource. They've produced more, more and more powerful data briefs over time, um, including on great mental health topics and some very powerful and informative ones on suicide prevention. We were also supported in our work by the Frymore Fund at the University of Vermont, 
and um, the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine Educational Technologies. Next slide. So just a quick overview, um, I'll talk a little bit about recent trends in Vermont firearm suicide deaths, um, and then we'll transition to Dr. Bell. We'll talk about risk factors for some firearm suicide death, including impulsivity, um, access to firearms, and then she'll also review some public health informed strategies for reducing firearm suicide. And then at the end, we have a review of, of what we talked about and um, opportunity for discussion and questions at that point, if, if it works for the committee. Um, Representative Lippert, you mentioned wanting to see the trend data earlier. So this is 10-year trend data from 2011 to 2020. It doesn't have that um, shockingly bad number that Alison Krompf uh, referred to for 2021 because that hasn't been finalized. But what that number is going to do is make the, um, the red line on this chart much higher at the right end. Um, so we are expecting that the suicide death rate for 2021 is going to be higher and potentially substantially higher than it was for 2020. But what this um, graph shows is the red line is for Vermont uh, rates of suicide death per 100,000 population. We use rates because it allows us to compare across populations that have different sizes. And the blue is the U.S. national uh, suicide death rate per 100,000. You can see that the Vermont rate is more variable, and that's just because we are a smaller population. You can also see that the Vermont rate is consistently higher than the US rate, um, and that currently there seems to be a trend where we're, um, we're getting differentially worse in our rate over time. Can I, can I interrupt, and just I apologize for interrupting you, but um, you. we just wanted to check, uh, and this is for you, but also for our committee assistant as to whether what you're sharing on the screen now has been posted on our committee page. I don't believe it has. Is that something that has this been provided to our committee assistant? And if not, uh, at some point, we certainly would want it to be. And when it is, Claire, I'm, I'm speaking to uh, our committee assistant, Claire, uh, if and when you receive it, if you could post it on our committee page so members and the public can access it as well. Yeah, I apologize. Um, the it was not um, shared before the this session started, but um, I think Dr. Bell has the final version. She'll she'll send that to Claire. Okay, great. And if she receives it, even while you're talking, we can post it. But okay. if not, we'll do it after after it's been after we've been reviewed it. So I apologize because I was interrupting your train of thought, and you were talking about how the Vermont suicide the the rate of suicides in Vermont is higher and differs from the national average. Can I ask you to kind of recap some of that again? Yes, absolutely, it's, it's no problem. The, the Vermont rates are the, the red line over time and they are consistently higher. Um, we've actually done this graph going back to 2004 and even 17 years ago, it was still the same case. Um, the general trend is that um, in the last three, four, five years, um, Vermont's rate has been significantly higher than the U.S. rate. And even when we see individual years where we approach the U.S. rate, in subsequent years, we get higher again. So um, it, does, it does imply that there's something different about our population and about possible factors influencing people's mental health and, um, and perhaps having to do with resources. And just, just so I can, again, make sure that we're clear, we're talking about all suicide deaths uh, here, not strictly what you were referencing earlier, which is fire, firearm suicides. This is all deaths, all, all deaths by suicide. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll drill down a little bit on the firearm deaths in the next slides. Yeah. Okay. Um, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> this is a graphic um, from the Vermont Department of Health. And what it does is it shows you these two pie charts. The pie chart on the left shows um, self-harm visits that were seen at Vermont hospitals. This is from the Vermont Uniform Hospital Discharge data set for the year 2020. And you can see that people who engaged in intentional self-harm, which includes suicide attempt, non-fatal suicide attempt, um, were seen at, at Vermont uh, emergency departments, uh, most often for poisoning, and then after that for cutting and then some other um, sources as well. So suffocation, fire, flame injury, things like that. 
Um, if you look on the right, these are the actual suicide deaths. So these are what was recorded um, by the office of the chief medical examiner and then shared with the Vermont Violent Death Reporting System and the Vermont Department of Health. You can see in this chart that firearm deaths actually account for about three out of five of all suicide deaths. Um, this is in contrast with the US. So US nationally, firearms account for about half of suicide deaths in any given year. And going way back in time for Vermont data, we've seen that um, we're consistently higher than the national averages for uh, firearm suicide death rates. Next slide. This is a really important slide and it gets at the idea of um, lethality and irreversibility. So if you look at the top part of this, um, it shows us that um, for the injury bar, um, that most of the firearm injuries, and this is all firearms data, most of the firearm injuries that are seen in Vermont emergency departments are unintentional. So they are accidental discharges or things like that, hunting accidents, um, followed by homicide or assault. There are some suicide and self-harm attempts represented in those data. And there's also some attributed, attributed to legal intervention. If you look at the bar immediately below that, that's the deaths data. So these are um, all firearm deaths that occurred in 2019 and 2020. And you can see the vast majority of those, over 90% of those were actually suicide deaths. This really drives home the point that when people attempt to take their life using a firearm, and this point was made earlier in this session, but um, it's highly, highly lethal and it's also largely irreversible. So. Um, I've heard Dr. Bell make this point several times that um, she doesn't get to see the children who attempt to take their life by um, firearms usually because they don't make it to the pediatric intensive care unit or they don't make it to the emergency department. And that again has to do with the lethality of, of the means that are being used. Um, if we look at the bottom, we can, the bottom chart <clears throat> just organizes um, firearm suicide deaths, so specific to firearms, as a function of age category and biological sex. And what you can see is the, um, the dark blue bars are um, males and the lighter blue bars that are lower are females. And you can see that across all the age categories, um, males are at substantially greater risk of dying by firearm suicide than females are of dying by firearm suicide. And in general, males are at greater risk for suicide, but um, that disparity is even larger when you account for firearm suicide deaths. We can go to the next slide. Um, this is a slide that really drives home the fact that there's a lot of geographical variability in the state when it comes to firearm suicide deaths. And what this slide does is for every county, the yellow lines show um, firearm injuries and the, I guess, purple dark lines show um, firearm suicide, or this is just death rates. Um, and these, these actually um, collapse across all types of um, intent. So it's suicidal and non-suicidal intent. But you can see that in Orleans County, um, the rates per 100,000 for firearm injury are high. That's 15.4 per 100,000. Um, and then for death for firearms, it's substantially higher than that. It's about 40% 40, 40 higher. And then you can see the rates go consistently down all the way to Grand Isle, where it's such a small county that there were not actually any firearm deaths recorded during, during the time for this chart. Um, it is generally seen that more rural counties do have higher rates of both firearm injury and firearm death rates. Um, and that's that seems to be true for um, suicide firearm deaths as well. You see that there is a lot of variability. You can also see that firearm deaths across all these counties are much more common than firearm injuries. That again, ties back to the issue of lethality. Firearms are just inherently more lethal if you're gonna be injured by a firearm than say accidental poisoning or intentional self-poisoning. Um, we also know that most of these deaths in this chart, um, 90%, are actually suicide deaths. So you can interpret this chart largely as reflecting suicide deaths across the counties that are attributable to um, firearms. And finally, a really important note for us to, um, to make is that we, we may think that um, firearms are not actually that common. You know, when I lived in Chittenden County, 
I don't think any of my neighbors had firearms and I didn't have firearms in my house. Um, in the 2018 or 2019 behavioral risk factor surveillance system, however, we got a pretty good picture of the, the prevalence, if you will, of firearms in Vermont households. And we found that 43% of all Vermont households by self-report had one or more firearm in them. Um, and that's gonna be a really important point for what Dr. Bell's gonna say about um, increased risk in, in firearms, uh, in homes that have firearms. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna take over and um, go through a few slides. And as a reminder, I'm a pediatrician. And so um, my work is really with youth, um, but Tom really has a good handle um, and others on this um, here today have a good handle on like the statewide data that includes adult data. So um, this is the most recent data we have for, um, this is through the CDC fatality um, reporting system. I just pulled this up uh, this afternoon. This is the last 15 years we have data for, and you can see just a wide variability in um, suicide death rates among states across the country. So this is youth, the, those under the age of 18 by any cause for the last 15 years. And Vermont stands out, especially, especially in our region. <clears throat> and this is, um, if you just, pull out um, by firearms. So the maps, um, when you compare suicide deaths, both for young people and for adults and compare them um, when you take all cause and then you just take firearms, those maps look very similar. Um, and that is because firearms are a real driver in the disparity we see in suicide rates when we compare states with each other. And this is a study that just kind of drives that home. This is, um, this is from about 15 years ago um, where researchers took um, states that had high gun ownership and then states with low gun ownership and compared their suicide um, death rates. And Vermont was not included as in one of the high gun states, but would fit, I think would, was going to be the next state that would be included. So sort of fits under this first, um, under this first column here. And so um, they, they gathered the, the population of these states so that they would, they would be equal and then looked at um, their suicide death rates um, or death numbers. And, and what they really saw, this was sort of looking at the, um, what, what really is a myth, but a common refrain, which is, you know, um, some may have heard people say, well, if they didn't have the gun, they would have found another way. They would have used something else and the outcome would have been the same. Um, but if that were to be true, you would expect that when you compared both non-firearm and firearm related suicide um, deaths, that in the states with low, um, low gun ownership, when they, the, these folks might not have firearms as accessible to them, you would expect them to have higher non-firearm um, suicide death rates. Those are about the same across. So this is, um, these are female here, these are male rates. So really the disparity when you look at the total suicide, which is about twice, twice the rate, it's really coming from firearm suicide and it's not compensated by people finding another method and using another method and dying by suicide in another way. Um, so this is, a, this is a group out of the um, Harvard School of Public Health um, who have looked, who really looked at this and they've really looked at, um, you can see at the top there, the who, what, when, where, and why. And that's something that, you know, for a good reason we focus on when we're thinking about suicide prevention and, um, you know, there's a big focus on why, why did this happen? Um, but their real focus is, is on how, and that the how really matters, probably more than, definitely more than most people recognize or realize, and that the means really matter when we're talking about suicide. So here, there, there are a few, many, studies on this, but um, this is an example of a study looking at survivors of near lethal suicide attempts and found that about a quarter spent, and, the, and these are also young people, I should say, um, 
this is 13 to 34 years of age. So this is on the younger age spectrum. About a quarter spent less than five minutes between the decision that they made when they made the decision they were gonna attempt suicide and the attempt. And um, it's, it's not um, intuitive at all, but that impulsive attempts are more likely to be violent. So with a firearm or, um, or another method that tends to be more violent. Um, and they tend to have, they're less likely to have a history of mental illness, less likely to have a history of depression and less likely to have made other attempts in the past, but maybe more likely to have um, done other impulsive things like gotten into fights or, or other impulsive behaviors. So it's really the impulsivity as opposed to um, a long history of mental illness. And uh, Tom talked about the lethality when we, when we think about firearms and suicide attempts, but here's really when we think about lethality, it's really determined by the inherent deadliness of the method. So, um, so certainly firearms um, are, you know, are, are very deadly accessibility. And that's where we see that difference when we look at states um, where there, there's just more firearms in the home, they're more accessible. Ease of use. So if somebody is comfortable with a firearm, if they know how to use it, they're more likely to, to use it as an option. Um, and then the ability to abort mid-attempt. So I take care of lots of young people, unfortunately, who end up in the pediatric intensive care unit after a suicide attempt most commonly from an ingestion. And at the time, and, and they can get, they're in the ICU because they're very sick. Um, and, uh, you know, they often, oftentimes we have to use pretty extensive measures to help um, reverse the effects of those medications or whatever it was that they had ingested. Um, but, you know, the next day or whenever they're feeling better and we talk to them about what happened, what they often describe is um, a, a crisis, a, a temporary crisis, usually like an interpersonal crisis, something with, with um, friends or family or a relationship. And they feel what they describe to me often is that they're, they're feeling a lot of pain and they're feeling really upset and they want that pain to go away. Um, but at the same time, often have not really thought about the consequences or thought through exactly what they thought was going to happen. And will will often talk to me about long-term plans that they have, you know, oh, I was just thinking about what I was going to sign up for, for my college courses when I start college in a few months, like that sort of thing. Um, so in the moment they're having a crisis and they turn to what's available and, um, and oftentimes what's you know, accessible and what they can use. But then they um, either have, someone has a chance to find them or after the attempt, they reach out to friends, they reach out to family members and let them know they made this attempt and then they can get help and then we can help them. Um, so firearms uh, are the ability to abort after the attempt or during the attempt is just not there. Um, and that's what, it's another factor that makes them so lethal. Uh, we keep driving this home, but I can't think of many other things in medicine where there are more deaths than there are hospital visits. So this is um, data from, uh, this is from 2018. This is from the health department, but um, firearms cause 74 deaths each year in Vermont, um, but only 39 ED visits, CR visits, because it, again, it's instant, these are instantly fatal in, in many cases. The children that I've taken care of in Vermont who end up in the pediatric intensive care unit who I, who I care for with firearm injuries are um, unintentional injuries as opposed to self-inflicted. So the, the, the upside of this though, is that we do have evidence that if firearms are stored safely, that these um, injuries and deaths can be reduced. So this was a study um, that it was a case control study where they, um, researchers found households where a child or adolescent under the age of 20 
shot a firearm either intentionally in a suicide attempt or unintentionally and injured somebody like themselves or somebody else. And then they compared those storage practices of firearms in those households to other households that also had firearms but didn't have a shooting incident. And they looked at the way the differences in storage. And what they found was if the gun is stored locked, if it's stored unloaded, if the ammunition is locked and the ammunition is stored in a separate location, each one of those storage practices helps reduce the likelihood of a shooting incident and all four together had a cumulative protective effect. So when we talk about safe storage, this is what we're talking about these four, um, these four aspects of safe storage. The gun is locked, the gun is unloaded, the ammunition is locked and it's stored in a separate location. So the, um, the, this is a 2018 behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which Tom had alluded to. Um, so first we have just under half of Vermont households reported that they have firearms in their home. Um, we expect that, you know, this, these are folks responding to a telephone survey. So it may be a little bit higher than that. Um, and when, when then the um, researchers asked about storage practices, um, those with firearms in the home, 17% of them um, kept them loaded and 65% of those kept them unlocked. And here you have the breakdown of what that would then look like for if you just took all of Vermont households. So if you look at all of Vermont households um, and you extrapolate this from this survey, then about 7% of all Vermont households have a loaded firearm in the home and about 5% of all Vermont households have a loaded firearm in the home that is unlocked. So this is something that um, I talk about with, Tom and I talk about with healthcare providers because we should just be assuming that the, our families that we're interacting with, that they have firearms in their home because about half of them do. And of course it varies by geographic location, but we should just make that assumption and be talking about safe storage with, with everyone we interact with um, in the clinical setting. Uh, the, the other question is, what about how, um, firearm ownership in um, Vermont homes that have children and don't have children? And there's no statistical difference there. So um, about equal, you, you know, you're equally likely in the among the survey respondents to say you have firearms and you have children or don't have children in the home. So knowing, knowing much of this, Tom and I now, this is like pretty old. <laughs> it's like from four years ago now. Um, we actually, we had, um, you know, so many people um, really wanting to know, like, how do we even have this conversation? We're not well-trained. Healthcare providers don't feel well-trained to have a conversation about safe storage. How do we do it in a way that's effective, that can be non-judgmental, that we can get people to change their behavior? And so we looked at all of the available um, um really all the available research to see, you know, what people knew and what kind of training there was. And there, there really wasn't much, um, uh, or there were good trainings, but they were pretty long. Um, and so we decided to make our own module on, um, for really for healthcare providers, um, but really anyone could probably benefit from this, um, which is free and available on the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program website, which we can um, share the link with you all on how we talk about firearm safe storage. And it really revolves around pres presuming that there are firearms in the home, just asking how they're stored instead of trying to ask, like, do you have firearms, do you not have firearms? And, um, and how do we encourage people to get to a place where they're storing their firearms safely in their home? So we have, um, so we can give you an example of that work. And then um, I then was asked to help consult on a national project doing the, a similar thing and um, our work that Tom and I and our partners did on the VCHIP module was, some of it was used in this um, national module called, it's called a SAFER program, Storing Firearms Prevent, Prevents Harm through the National American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, which was, you know, they had a little bit more of a budget. So it's a, it's a um, little bit more high quality videos and they got actual actors, but really looking at how we can have these conversations to be effective um, and to 
to um, impact, you know, really meaningful change in people's behaviors around storage. And we can, I can talk about this more if people are interested in what kind of language we use when we talk about this. But this is just became now available last month. It's also free and available for anyone. It's really geared towards healthcare providers, but really anyone um, can, can go through it and learn from it. So I'm, I'm pretty um, happy about this product. Uh, so this is just our last two slides. So really, um, in, in in summary, I, I again like I take care of young people who um, attempt suicide, and I know that in you know in the moment um, they are oftentimes feeling pain, and they oftentimes want that pain to go away, and they make can make very serious attempts. But we know that ninety percent of people who survive near lethal suicide attempts do not later go on to die by suicide. Every one of those young people that we work hard to make better, we feel we feel good about. We are so happy um, that they are okay. I mean, that's the first thing I always say when, when they're able to talk to us again. I say, I'm, I'm so happy you, you texted your friend about this. I'm so happy you, you called your mom after you did this, and we are so glad that you're okay. Um, and know that they will likely not go on to die by suicide. Those who attempt suicide with firearms compared to other methods, they almost always die. If they don't die, they have significant, significant morbidity. Um, they're more likely to have made the attempt impulsively, which again is not intuitive to most folks. A lot of times people think, well, if they use a firearm, they must have been very intent on dying and that it tends to actually be the the opposite. Um, and they tend to be less likely to ha um, have depression or other mental illness compared to those who use other methods. And so um, it's much harder to identify um, signs and symptoms ahead of time or warning signs. And really what um, Tom and I believe and pediatricians and other um, folks who, who other healthcare providers believe is what we really need to do is create this environment of safety so that young people, um, when they're in that crisis moment, don't have access to that firearm. Um, we know that we cannot prevent, protect young people from ever experiencing a crisis, but we can prevent them from dying during one. So this is just our, our last summary slide that Vermont suicide death rates are consistently higher than the US in recent years, and this is true for our entire population is also true for our youth population. Firearms are used um, for, it, it's the most common method used in Vermont, um, more than any other method combined. Firearms make up the majority of our suicide deaths in Vermont. That we know from research that safe storage is a key aspect of reducing firearm suicide risk and that educating healthcare and other types of providers to engage their patients about firearm safe storage is a promising ap approach. And we also hope that in talking to this committee um, and doing other types of outreach that um, we can encourage people, everyone to talk about safe storage just um, in our general practice. You know, we've talked a lot about um, having the COVID conversation about what you're comfortable with um, doing with friends and family. And I think this is an opportunity to, um, you know, as we as maybe potentially start to hang out with people more and engage more to actually start talking about, um, say, you know, firearm storage and safe storage in homes, um, in our own homes and places that we visit in a way that's just, um, again, not non-judgmental, but that we make as an important sort of safety checklist um, in, in all of our lives. I think that can go a long way. Uh, so I'll end here and thank you so much for, for the committee for first taking time to address this really important issue um, for all the work that you do in general on this, on this topic um, and for inviting Tom and I to speak to you today. Thank you, thank you so very much. Uh, this is really important information for us to have in front of us as we look at the issues in front of our committee in terms of funding suicide prevention, but also understanding more in depth about suicide prevention, uh, uh, particularly in suicide prevention here in Vermont. So 
We do have, uh, I think we have some time and uh, I'd like to open it up to questions from the committee and I'll first go to Representative Black. I, I think that um, Emily has indicated to me that she had wanted to add one additional thing. So maybe if she can- Absolutely, that. Thank, thank you. Uh, Emily, welcome back to our screen and we welcome you. Thank to you, thank you. Um, a little bit more composed right now, thank you. Um, I wanna really read reiterate what Dr. Bell was talking about. Um, our son didn't have a phone. He had, you know, a computer and a, a div, you know, an iPad. And when they did the forensic on it, they found nothing on the device to suggest anything until five minutes before this occurred. And so had he not had access to a gun, that moment could have been interrupted and he could have gotten help in that moment for whatever crisis. None of us know what that crisis was, but that, you know, having that moment interrupted would have probably saved his life. So I just really wanted to reiterate that. Um, I feel that's really, really important. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that and uh, underscoring that, that, Oh, let me let me turn to Representative Black and then. Uh, well, I have se I have several questions of several different people, so I just thought that. Right. Would you like me to start? Sure, I would. <laughs> so, first of all, a uh, question um, for Nick. I I think you were you were talking about data. Um, are is there data we're not collecting that we could be collecting? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, you know, we in the legislature we have the ability to receive data and then be able to target solutions for that. Is there any data right now that we are not collecting as a state that we could be collecting so that we would have more information when forming policies going forward? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Black. There, you know, that's definitely part of the work of this grant is uh, to focus on what don't we know and what other information do we need. Um, you know, and there's probably a lot of different examples where we could collect additional information. And so, what uh, what make what might make the most sense is um, to to follow up with you with some 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 of the suggestions that have been raised. Um, we are, as I mentioned before. Um, going to be kicking off uh, the development of a, a social autopsy um, data linkage project to kind of look at for everyone who dies by suicide, um, what other information can we pull from our both state and community partners um, to better analyze kind of what, you know, what's happening to people during that last um, last year. And I think as we go through that process, we'll also start to identify other data elements that aren't collected or are really hard to get. Um, so if it's okay, we might follow up and, and give you more information about that um, as the session goes along. Great, and I'm glad to hear that's going to be taking place. Um, Dr. Delaney, I know, I know there's a number and I can't pull the number out of my hand, but to me, the most important thing that we can stress and Vermonters need to know this, if you have an unsecured firearm in your home, I know that there is a number that makes your child much more likely to die by suicide. What is that number? I'm not sure I have the actual number on that, the tip of my tongue, I'm sorry. There's, um, there was an epidemiological study done a while back showing that overall risk of, of any violent death in the household was about 20 times higher if there was a firearm in the household than if there was not a firearm in the household. So just, just having the gun in the home is a risk factor for suicide as well as homicide. I, 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 really, I really feel like Vermonters need to know that. Um, that you know, if, you have, if you have particularly young people in your home, you're putting your home at risk by doing that. By trying to protect yourself from outside, your risk is really in, you're putting yourself at risk inside. Um, and regarding, we have, a, and I'm not sure who would be able to answer this, if anyone, there is a, there's the gun shops project, um, where 
FFLs, gun shops will give out information regarding suicide. I'm wondering, does anyone know if they're being given information about safe storage um, to give to customers, um, encouraging safe storage when somebody purchases a gun? Is it, does anyone know if that work is being done at all at the um, transactional level? I know that it's being evaluated. So the, the group that um, Dr. Bell mentioned at Harvard, the Means Matter group is actually working with the state of New Hampshire and some other states that are implementing the, the gun shop project to evaluate um, the effectiveness of, of the interventions. My understanding is that Vermont, Vermont piloted the gun shop project for a couple of years and um, it really was about distribution of materials. So we didn't have a really robust study of, of what was happening in the actual interactions, but we did, we had a bunch of gun shops that agreed to distribute materials. And my very last question, I promise. Um, Terry, you had mentioned um, about a director, and I know that um, the administration, Allison, you've, there's a request for a coordinator. Can, can someone explain what the difference between the two that of what's being requested regarding that a statewide director versus a statewide coordinator? Sure, Terry. I don't know if I mean it's it's a proposal coming outside of the state, so I welcome you to start, and I'm happy to to jump in. Yeah. So if you think about the roles of a coordinator and you think about the roles of a director, they're two very different roles. Um, a director directs the services, um, a, coordinate, a coordinator coordinates the services is more of that um, boots on the ground. We have tons of boots on the ground people that need to be directed. So we already have a, um, many of those coordinator positions in place, Center for Health and Learning, the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center. There's the, the services are already being provided, but how do we pull them together as a state to make sure there's the cohesiveness and the continuity of care in the world of suicide? So we, we don't need more... Um, we don't need more Indians, we need a chief to pull everything together. And I hate to put it e even in, in that kind of form, but we need somebody to direct the services and to take information from all stakeholders, um, including our physical health providers, our law enforcement, 911. It's not just a, um, a designated agency or Vermont suicide um, coalition um, center question. It is getting all that information together and directing how the services and the funding is going to be distributed. That is my 300 mile snapshot in my head of how I think all this is going to work together um, and what our group thought would be most beneficial to um, make sure that the continuum of care of all the services and all of the funding asked work together. <laughs> I would just so add any comments if, if. sure when this came about and so um right now we have like the National Suicide Prevention Resource Center requires that someone's listed um per state as a lead for suicide prevention efforts and that position is called the state suicide prevention coordinator so when we were and right now my name is on it, um, but we need a full person. And so that's where that came from. I think the department is open to looking at language and, um, and considering you know, in more detail about what type of role would be most beneficial. Okay, that's helpful to know. Thank you. Representative Goldman, no, I think, let me just say just for ourselves, I think we should probably set a time of what, 10 up so that we yeah, can get yeah. to the, floor, which we have a floor session at three o'clock today. So Representative Goldman. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you presenting this problem as a public health issue because it is. And um, for those people who work in medicine, um, you know, the opiate crisis was a public health issue as well. And there was a connection with licensure and CMEs that were required so that um, clinicians were required to interact with patients about this issue. 
um, or you know, the opioid issue. So what I'm wondering is, is there a parallel between this kind of issue of preventing suicide and communicating with clinicians to talk to their patients when they see them in their offices to try and reduce unsecured guns? Does that question make sense? Yeah, um, I, I can I can jump in and, and answer if that's okay with folks. I think um, <clears throat> I I think it it's very important. I think with um, the opioid crisis, the particular um, very important and very necessary sort of regulations around um, training and oversight is a little bit different because physicians were, were part of the problem in terms of writing the prescriptions and not, right? So um, that is an unusual case, and but a very necessary case where these this is sort of strict, strictly regulated in terms of we all have to do a certain amount of training every year and, um, and CME around this. Um, so, but that, you know, that being said, I think, um, you know, Tom and I have been asked by, um, you know, Vermont Medical Society, Vermont, um, the um, pediatricians in Vermont and family medicine folks in Vermont to speak during, we've done a number of sort of CME and other, other talks about this. I think one of the challenges of this conversation is it's, it's counseling and people are nervous about it. They're nervous that they're not going to say the right thing. Um, they're nervous that they're going to, I didn't, you know, we have some data on this too, I didn't present, but people are, are nervous. You know, they feel like they don't have the training to do it, which is why we've set out to create this training module because people need more knowledge and they need more confidence in how to have this conversation. So they're worried, I'm going to alienate this patient. If I don't say it in the right way, um, I'm going to ruin our therapeutic relationship. So, th so there's a lot, it, it's, 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 it's sort of complex. Um, you know, and other, other studies have looked at, um, I know in the world of pediatrics, like do you, put, do you have something like firearm safe storage on like a checklist or an intake checklist, like lots of different ways to look at it. Um, and there are pros and cons to that, um, which I can get into, but, but part of it is that people are nervous and less likely to have, um, to, to, to really, acknowledge uh, like in in writing like they don't want their the information about firearms in their home to be like in their medical record and so what Tom and I recommend in our training is that we don't actually like write it down or look like we're asking anyone to write it down it's a conversation and we make it a part of our safety conversations and in pediatrics we recommend that it's part of our general well child care so you, you're going through, you're like talking about bike helmets and you talk about, you're talking about home safety and you talk about firearms as part of it. Um, so I think there's opportunities to do it with every visit, with every, like a well child visit um, or an annual visit. And then of course, when you're, you have more concerns too is, an, uh, is another place, but, but yeah, we, I mean, physicians are worried and other healthcare providers are worried about um, how to even have this conversation. So that was sort of the like intent behind the modules that people just weren't having these conversations because they felt like they didn't have the training. The question is like, are medical schools going to start incorporating some of this stuff into their training going forward? Um, that needs to happen as well and something we're advocating for. And, you know, that module I showed you from the AP, I mean, that just came out last month. That is the first time we've had like a really nice comprehensive training for pediatrician. Like this is pretty late, it's new and late and it has needed to be happening for a long time. So um, so a lot more needs to happen. And then there's the mental health providers and lots of other people interact with families that wanna have this training, which is why we wanna make it free and available to people outside of the healthcare field as well. Thank you, your, your data was so compelling. I'm just feeling like, yikes, that's all. Great, thank you. Well, uh, we need time to yeah, I think I think we needed time to stretch. We need time to go to the floor. That's not important. So um, let me thank everyone, uh, each of you, for being part of this uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, thank you all. And uh, as I said, I'm sure we're going to return to this issue again at another point in time. Uh, but this was very, very, very helpful. So thank you for making the time to be with us today. And especially, uh, we realize that sometimes this format is not the most 
uh, personal, but uh, we recognize that uh, a number of you shared some very personal uh, stories as well. And we appreciate your willingness to do that in this format, which we are all uh, accustomed or growing accustomed to, but not quite completely comfortable with. So thank you for thank you for being adaptive in helping us hear, hear your stories today. And I think with that, may I say one last please, thing? Please, yes, let me represent that. I wanted to acknowledge Emily and I wanted to wish her son a happy birthday. I mean, I know how hard birthdays are and the fact that you did this when I know what you're going through right now. Very, very great. Very so thank you and have and thank you Ryan. thank you and thank you for having me thank you thank you for being here thank you so much thank you representative